is very, very exciting to see such a large crowd here this afternoon. Um, the overwhelming interest in the story of the Krieger witch trial is a moving testament to the fact that the life of someone who lived near this site more than 250 years ago and the unfortunate actions of her neighbors can still have lessons to teach us all. When I first started working on this project last year, and Joyce Held of the Pownal Historical Society, who will be telling us about Widow Krieger's life and her many names shortly, informed me that the Pownal Witch Trial likely occurred in the mid to late 1780s, I was quite surprised by just how late that was, historically speaking. I had no idea that we were still subjecting people to torturous traumatic witch trials well after the Revolutionary War and American independence, fought and won, supposedly, so that everyone, no less than the widow of one of this small town's early settlers, could pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're all familiar, at least by name, with the Salem witch trials, a real-life social hysteria resulting in the execution of 20 women and men, which occurred in eastern Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693. In fact, the Salem witch trials have become one of New England's foundational historical narratives. However, they were only the best known of dozens of recorded instances in New England throughout the 17th and 18th centuries where women and occasionally men were accused of witchcraft and put through incredible trauma, often with little to no evidence. In the 20th century, New England's persecution of witches came to be used as a cautionary tale about the dangers of extremism, false accusations, and lapses in due process. In 1956, with the Cold War still going strong, Shirley Jackson, the famed author of gothic fiction who lived just 30 minutes north of here in North Bennington, wrote a book about the Salem witch trials intended for elementary school readers ages 8 to 12. The lessons to be learned were thought to be so important they were being imparted to young children. I provide this historical context which is featured in Bennington Museum's current exhibition Haunted Vermont on view through the end of the year. Just a little bit of a plug but also one of the main reasons why um, we ended up um, choosing to erect this marker to um, the Krieger witch trial um, last year as part of the planning process for that exhibition. Um, but I, I give that context to help us better understand why Vermont's only recorded witch trial, trial still has relevance to us today. Of course, the term witch hunt is being bandied about a lot these days in the media. And regardless of our personal political leanings, I hope we can all agree that the dangers of extremism, false accusations, and lapses in due process are as dangerous today, whether on a personal or national level, as they were some 235 years ago. I'll end my part of the ceremony um, with a similar sentiment from 222 years ago, a quote from an article published in the Vermont Gazette on May 4th, 1801, the local paper in this corner of the state at that time, on what the author saw as a decrease in witchcraft during his 35 years. Quote, he wrote, when I, a boy, when I was a boy, I well remember that scarcely a week passed without hearing some tale of recent witchcraft. In those days, if a man was taken out of his warm bed and ridden a hundred miles through the air, it was certainly some old witch who did it. Now it is turned off upon a dream, a disturbed imagination, or at best, the nightmare. I hereby declare it as my opinion that this decrease is owing to the fact that every generation grows wiser and wiser. I will add better and better, and not a word more. So today, in dedicating this marker to commemorate the trial of Widow Krieger, we seek to remind ourselves and future generations of the dangers of seeking to harass and harm our neighbors, literal and figurative, simply because they may be different than us. Let us be wiser and better than those who came before us. Of course, a project of this nature is the work of many hands. And so before I hand off the mic um, to Joyce um, and we learn the real story about the, the Widow Krieger, I'd like to extend a thanks to all those who are involved in helping to make this marker a reality. Um, first, my colleagues at the Bennington Museum, Martin Mahoney, our executive director, who gave me a green light the second 
I brought up this marker as a possibility. Yeah. Alex Jones, who is here today, um, who helped shepherd the grant application to the Pomeroy Foundation for the marker from beginning to end. Um, Dina Mallory, who is over at the Bennington Museum, who can help children and adults alike with a craft project after the unveiling of the marker, um, as well as the officers and trustees of the Bennington Museum. Um, this project was a collaboration between the Bennington Museum and the Pownall Historical Society. So I'd like to um, thank the Pownall Historical Society board members, members Jeremy Ishia, is that Ishia, Deb Baker, Joyce Held, Pauline Gutlow, Ken Held, Rich Ryder, and Megan Albert, um, the Witch Trial Committee, um, um, including again Deb Baker, Pauline Gutloy, Joyce Held, Deborah Heater, Diane Taylor, Ken Held, Gail Wood, Carol Thompson, and myself. Um, and of course, we wouldn't be here unless somebody gave us permission to put a sign on this property. So we would like to thank the Panel Select Board and the members of the Panel Select Board, including Mike Gardner, Bob Jarvis, Annie Ra Angie Rawling. Brian Harris, Jamie Percy, along with Tara Parks, executive assistant, and Hannah Darling, administrative assistant, who were very helpful from the beginning to end um, and giving us permission and helping to make this um, um, possible. Um, we'd also like to thank Joel Bur Burrington, the local road um, foreman, and his team who brought this trailer, who literally physically put the sign in the ground, who filled in mud puddles behind us yesterday so that we wouldn't be walking through them. So thank you to them. Um, um, to Eddie Pascucci, um, the panel constable, for helping um, to direct traffic and keep order, um, as well as volunteers from the local fire departments. Um, we'd like to thank Sean O'Donovan, O'Donovan from Sand Gravel and Excavation of North Panel, who helped sponsor today's music, um, and Bill Baker and Morgan Prout for volunteer assistance. Um, and we would like to thank Andy Cavolos of the Vermont Folklife Center, which is the Vermont State Institutional Sponsor of Legends and Lore. And today we have Sean Harrington, curator of the Manchester Historical Society, as well as a board member of the Vermont Folklife Center. I'm here to say a couple of words, and before he comes up, I'll just say that it was really um, his spearheading the Legends and Lore Pomeroy Foundation marker for the Manchester Vampire up um, at the Factory Point Cemetery in Manchester last year, which was really the inspiration um, behind me um, coming to the Panel Historical Society and deciding to do this. So thank you very much, Sean, and if you'd like to come up and say a couple of words. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie, this is the turnout here today is incredible. I just want to really just say how wonderful it is to take part in this. Andy couldn't be here. Today is his wedding anniversary. So I was elected as a trustee of Vermont Folk Life to come down just to, very quickly, just to... Uh, just to thank everybody for coming here, to thank Jamie, uh, the Bennington Museum, the Pownall Historical Society, all the staff, all the volunteers who made this possible. Uh, most importantly, to thank the Pomeroy Foundation for supporting the program to document the folklore, the legends and beliefs of Vermont through Legends and Lore program. Uh, this also extends you know, around New England, so if you have a story that you think the marker should be dedicated to, please, by all means, go reach out to Jamie, reach out to myself, you can visit uh, vtfolklife.org. Uh, you know, this is something we would like to see to continue to grow so these stories can be told. Uh, like I said, there is the Manchester Legends and Lore Marker, and there's also one in Marlboro to commemorate folk slinger and song collector Margaret MacArthur. So I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for being here, and I am going to turn it over now. So thank you. And last, before I hand the mic off to Joyce, I just want to read a letter um, from um, the folks at the William G. Pomeroy Foundation who created the Legends and Lore's marker program and provided the funding to have this marker fabricated. Um, Darren Pomeroy, a trustee of the Pomeroy Foundation, has provided us with the following remarks. Congratulations from all of us at the William G. Pomeroy Foundation on the dedication of your Legends and Lore roadside marker. We send our greetings from Syracuse, New York, as you unveil this marker that tells the story of Widow, the Widow Krieger Witch Trial. At the Pomeroy Foundation, one of our main initiatives is to help people celebrate their community's history. As we do, we do this by offering grants for roadside markers and plaques nationwide, as well as several other history-related initiatives, such as the National Historic Marker Day, which was hosted annually on the last Friday of April. We feel strongly that markers help educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote historic and cultural tourism. How did our mission come about? 
I don't know that I can cover the mic from the wind and talk at the same time. Um, how did our mission come about? My dad, Bill Pomeroy, who's our founder and trustee, has been passionate about history since my, his childhood. He has fond memories of riding in the car with my grandfather and seeing historical markers that they would stop for and read together. In 2005, when my dad established the foundation, he made funding historical markers a priority. He learned that New York State had stopped funding markers decades ago and left it to the communities to raise funds on their own. This was the impetus for the foundation's first marker grant program and later became the springboard for several more programs with a variety of themes, including legends and lore. This marker program helps communities promote cultural tourism by highlighting their local folklore and legends. Today, with this legends and lore marker, you recognize the long-standing lore surrounding Vermont's only known witch trial. For your collective efforts in obtaining this marker, we send our appreciation to the Bennington Museum, Townell Historical Society, and North Townell Community. We would also like to thank our state partner, the Vermont Folklife Center, which helps to vet our legends and lore applications from the Green Mountain State. From all of our dedicated staff and trustees at the Pomeroy Foundation, congratulations on your legends and lore marker. Darren Pomeroy, trustee, William G. Pomeroy Foundation. So now I hand over the mic to Joyce Help. <laughs> start, I'd like to say on behalf of the Connell Historical Society that we are most pleased to have been able to collaborate with the Bennington Museum on this project. Jamie, Dina, and Alex were so easy to work with and so much fun. Thank you all for helping us bring Widow Krieger's story to life. I have always been fascinated with the story that's been passed down from generation to generation about Widow Krieger and how she was tried as a witch. Although my research has yet to find a formal document about the trial, I was able to find the Krieger family who lived here in North Connell and the woman who became Widow Krieger in 1785. I'm sure Widow Krieger would have been quite happy to join us in our, widow, our witch's walk today in defiance of those who feel they have the right to accuse someone that they feel looks different, acts different, or has a personality that they might find odd as being a witch. Not to mention those who use the witch accusations for their own personal gain and to take land. If the widow were here today, I believe her story would be as such. Over my lifetime, I have been called by many names, but only one almost took my life, to be called a witch by neighbors. Brought before the safety commission, committee and put to a test to prove my innocence, filled my heart with sadness, and almost filled my lungs with the icy water from the Kusik River. Back in 1785, I thank my Lord that he saved me that day and the committee quitted me. The first name I remember being called was Daughter. My parents, Hans Peter and Barbara Schumacher, often called me Daughter rather than my given name, Marguerite. I was born in Williamstown, Massachusetts on April 24th, 1725. Growing up, I heard the tragic stories of, from sales about the witch trials and how horrible they were. Little did I know that someday I too would be a victim of those terrifying accusations. I was very young when I first met Johan Yuri Krieger, 14 years my senior. He was 
one of what the English would eventually call a Dutch squatter. He settled on land on the east side of the Rensselaerwick Manor in the 1730s. Johan built a much needed gristmill below an outcrop of rocks along the Hoosick River and a small home just north of it. We were married at the Albany Reformed Church on February 9, 1741, and I received a new name, Mrs. Krieger. Oh, I was so proud of that name, for Johan was a good man who took pride in his mill and his land. His pride served him well when the English came and declared the settlers squatters and took the land from them. The British settlement was called Connell after Thomas Connell, the governor of Massachusetts. The charter was signed January 8, 1760, and the town proprietors voted to grant a single ownership to squatter Johann Quigger in recognition of his improvements of the land. I think they needed his mill. The English gave us new names. Johann Yuri became John George, and I became Margaret. We had three sons, John, Peter, and William. Adding the name Mama to my list. The boys learned all about the mill and its construction and its maintenance, working by their papa. They took pride in their work too, and soon were recognized as talented millers. At a Williamstown proprietor meeting on October 15, 1767, it was voted to give John, Peter, and William land to build a corn mill. Our sons went off to Williamstown and a year and a half later, it was voted again to give the three brothers land, this time to set up a sawmill. The mills became known as Krigger Mills. Oh, my life was full of hard times, sad times, and times of celebration. We celebrated our son's accomplishments in Williamstown, not knowing that just four years later, we would be grieving the loss of our beloved son, Peter. I hadn't stopped wearing my mourning clothes before our youngest son, Sweet William, was killed at the, Bennington, at the Battle of Bennington. He left his wife and three little ones who called me Uma. Johan continued to work at the mill and I would help as needed, but it wasn't the same. I certainly, I certain, I am certain that the loss of our two young sons wore upon my husband. We had been married 44 years when Johann went to be with the Lord on a hot August day in 1785. I was now known as Widow Creek. I did my best to keep the mill going, but the law said, as a woman, I couldn't own land. So I soon was looked upon as a burden by my neighbors. My neighbor said I was an extraordinary woman with extraordinary powers. Oh, this made people suspicious and envious of me. They gave testimony and accused me of being a witch and brought me before the safety committee, proving were tongues sharper than ax. The committee decision was to cut a hole in the river cut a hole through the water, ice in the river, and I should be put into it. If I sank, I'd be afloat. But if I stayed afloat, that means the devil was holding me up and I was a witch. They cut the hole on a cold winter's day and everyone stood quietly, watching, waiting to see if the devil would keep me afloat. I was scared. Oh, Lord knows I was scared. But I wasn't going to give them the chance to call me another name, weak. So I stood tall and I stood strong and I let them drop me down through the hole. I remember sinking slowly down in the dark, icy river until my feet touched the bottom. Someone from above shouted, she sank. 
and people gathered to help pull me up and out of the river. I survived and I was acquitted. Maybe it wasn't the name witch that nearly did me in, but rather the name widow. After all, becoming a widow, I was looked upon as a burden who needed to be removed from the mill property. In the eyes of the people, since Johann was gone, I became a squatter with no rights to the land. Soon after, I moved back to my birthplace, Williamstown, Massachusetts. Prigger would mill wouldn't be, would go to another, for Prigger family had served their purpose in Palma. All that was left was the Prigger rocks that still stand scarred on what once was ours. Margaret Schumeyer, thank you. Thank you. Margaret Schumacher Krieger went to be with her beloved husband and two sons on February 21st in 1790, after dictating her last will and testament the day before. Leaving her estate to her surviving son John and his children, her 18 sheep, household contents, hymn book in Dutch language, and other items she left to her beloved grandchildren, Margaret, William, and John children of their late son, William Krieger. She signed her will with her mark, a very strong, bold M. She is buried in West Lawn Cemetery in Williamstown, Massachusetts, along with her husband, John, her son, Peter, and her granddaughter, Elizabeth. Yes, Margaret was an extraordinary person. But aren't we all in our own unique way? Thank you, and blessings to all. And now, and now we have a poem about the witch. Um, I think we're going to have a poem by Robert Frost about a witch. Oh. Poem. So, in 
So it's all about the fact. The poem is called The Papa Witch of Grafton. And here I am to tell it to you. Now you know the story. There's a lawsuit and each town wanted me to go to the other town. So they'd have to pack. Well, now that they've got it settled, who's I be? I'm going to tell them something they won't like. They've got it settled wrong, and I can prove it. For that, it must be to have two towns fighting to make a present of me to each other. They don't dispose me to save them any trouble. Double trouble is always the witch's motto. I'll double theirs. You watch me. They'll find they've got the whole thing to do over. That is, if facts is what they want to go by. They said a lot, now don't they, by a record of Arthur Amy having once been up for Hog Reed in March meeting here in Warren. I could have told them any time this 12 month that Arthur Amy I was married to couldn't have been the one they say was up in Warren at March meeting for the reason he was at 15 at the time they say. The Arthur Amy I was married voted the only times he ever voted, which wasn't many, in the town of Wentworth. One of the times was when it was in the warrant for the town to take over the tote road to our clearing where we live. I'll tell you who'd remember, Heman Labish. There, Arthur Amy was the father of mine. So, now they dragged it through the law course once, I guess they better drag it through again. Wentworth and Warren's both good towns to live in, only I happen to prefer to live in Wentworth from now on. And when all said, right's right. And the temptation to do right when I can hurt someone by doing it has always been too much for me. I know some folks that would be set up at having in their town a noted witch, but most would have to think of the expense that even I would be. They ought to know that as a witch I'd often milk a bath and that'd be enough to last for days. I'd make my position stronger think if I was to consent to give some sign that I was a witch. It wasn't no sign, I suppose, when Malice she said I took him out in his old age and wrote all over everything on him till I had him worn to skin and bones. And if I'd left him hitched unblanketed in front of one town hall, I'd left him hitched in front of everyone in Grafton County. Some cried, shame on me not to blanket him, the poor old man. It would have been all right if someone hadn't said to gnaw the post he stood beside and leave his trademark on them so they could recognize them. Not a post that they could hear tell of was scarified, but they made him keep on gnawing till he won. Then, that same smarty someone had said to look. He bet Hughes was a cribber and had gnawed the crib he slept in. And as sure as you're born, they found he, he gnawed all four of the posts of, of his bed, all four of them to splinters. Well, what did that prove? Not that he hadn't gnawed the hitching post. He said he had, besides, because a horse gnaws in the stable ain't no proof to me he don't gnaw trees, posts, and fences too. But everybody took it for a proof. I was a strapping girl of 20 then. The smarty someone who spoiled everything was Arthur Amy. You know who he was. That was the way he started courting me. He never said much after we was married, but I mistrusted he was none too proud of having interfered in the Hughes business. I guess he found he got more out of me by having me a witch, or something happened to turn him around. He got to saying things to undo what he'd done and make it right. Like, no, she ain't come back from cotton yet. Last night was one of her nights out. She's cutting. She thinks when the wind makes a night of it, she might as well herself. But he liked best to let on he was playing to death with me. If anyone had seen me coming home over the ridge pole stride of a broomstick as often as he had in the tail of the night, he guessed they'd know what he had to put up with. Well, I showed Arthur Amy signs enough. Off from the house, as far as we could keep, and from barn smells you can't wash out of plowed ground with all the rain and snow of seven years. And I don't mean just gulls of Rogers Rangers on Musalaki, but woman signs to man, only bewitched, so I wouldn't last any longer. Up where the trees grow short and the moss is tall, 
I mean, gather me wet snowberries on slippery rocks beside a waterfall. I made him do it for me in the dark, and he liked everything I made him do. I hope if he is where he sees me now, he's so far off, he can't come, he can't see what I've come to. He can't come down from everything to nothing. All is, if I'd have known when I was young and full of it, that this would be the end. It doesn't seem as if I'd have the courage to cook up in folks' faces. I might have Thank you, Joyce and Carol. Um, we're now going to move over to unveil the sign. Can we do it? So, of course, actually, standing from here, you can see Krieger Rock yeah. right, right above us, which is the river where she was tried. Um, this is the perfect spot. We're very happy to have it finally here. Um, we welcome everybody to stick around. There'll be music, there'll be snacks, like the cornhole set up. Come, enjoy, celebrate community and our history um, and enjoy. Thank you all very much. For